to another Tuesday. Tuesday VMR special poker session. Very excited to to conclude August uh, with uh, this last v, uh, Pocus VMR for, for this month. We'll hopefully have some more, but we had the month of August to, to run a couple of these sessions uh, every Tuesday. But I'm very delighted to, to have Dr. Ria Dancel join us today. Uh, she's coming to us from the Department of Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. And um, she directs the point of care ultrasound uh, elective curriculum and also the procedure service. And she takes care of a large number of uh, adults as well as pediatric cases of children as well. So I'm just going to ask Dr. Dancel to, to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. And I wanted to thank Ravi, um, especially for sort of pushing through um, having POCUS every Tuesday for the past month. It's been really exciting for, for me. And um, I see Sanjay Patel is on here, and he had an opportunity to present also. Um, I, I think you said it all. I'm a pediatrician. I'm an adult doctor. I do procedures. Um, POCUS is my jam. Uh, I do a lot of different things, wear a lot of different hats. Um, and I love all of them. Awesome, awesome. And I've had the honor to, to listen to some of your presentations at SHM. They have been truly remarkable. Okay. So uh, it's a it's an honor to have you on today. So um, I actually, I have Hans who will help co-discuss today. So Hans, you want to mute your mic and uh, introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Hans and I'm a graduate from Ross University. Um, you know, fairly recent and hoping to match. Right now I'm just a volunteer uh, observer and occasionally working like today. And today I'm lucky I'm in a very quiet place. So hopefully I can discuss through the end. Awesome, Hans. Great to have you on and uh, best of luck for Match 2023 and to everybody, all of our audience that's applying for Match 2023. I also want uh, Deborah and Shema to introduce themselves, their scribing and teaching points today. Go ahead, Deborah. Hi, everyone. And uh, today I do the teaching points. Excited for today. It was a great month of focus. And thank you, Dr. Ria, for being with us. Shema. Hello. So I'm unmuting from a very quiet place. So I'm very happy to see Dr. Ria here. I already watched the other focus sessions. I learned so much and I'm overcoming my focus phobia. And <laughs> yeah, and today I am the scribe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that focus phobia. So uh, we have neurophobia now, focus phobia on focus Tuesday. Phobia. So we're here to alleviate that. So I'll have uh, Dr. Dancel start with the first aliquot and we can bring up the whiteboard. I have far more neurophobia than any other phobia. <laughs> All righty. So I'm going to wear my, my pediatric hat today. I didn't warn you beforehand. Um, this is a 10 year old boy who is coming in with four days of left sided abdominal, pelvic, and flank pain. Okay, incredible. Um... Hans, you want to try taking a stab at this first and then I'll mm -hmm. back you up. So 10-year-old boy, left-sided abdominal, pelvic and flank pain. I was at first thought was um, maybe trauma that might have happened earlier and four days would be within the time period that he could have had injured his spleen, maybe an injury of the left-sided abdominal pain, even the kidney could be injured. So trauma, or maybe a trauma of the testicles, which would radiate into the abdominal area. Another possibility would be infection. But then of course, we will probably get more information from the physical exam as well with temperature. Uh, I'm not thinking about other possibilities such as maybe a malignancy or tumor that could be space occupying because that would be more insidious. And he would say it was more gradual and over a longer period than four days. So trauma would be at the top, followed by infection. And now I give the mic over. 
Oh, Hans, that was great, actually. I, I have to put on my uh, pediatric thinking hat. And uh, it was many years ago I rotated through pediatrics. But yes, uh, at 10 years of age, you want to really understand 10-year-old uh, year boys are very active. So trauma definitely uh, comes into mind uh, versus uh, uh, a geriatric patient who may not may not be active that much. So uh, definitely one would want to know uh, the surrounding events, but four days, uh, I usually would worry about life-threatening events and four days uh, is quite a long period of time, but of course they could be atypical presentations of life-threatening conditions. So on the left side, what could be life-threatening and you went through any sort of testicular problem, testicular torsion, um, could there be on the left side, colonic associated issues you also want to know the bowel habits uh, is any history of constipation what other abdominal organs are on that side uh the the kidney and then ureter does move down to the pelvis so you can connect both of those areas the spleen's higher up so yeah splenic uh trauma um can can definitely a laceration unlikely within four days you'd have massive amount of hemorrhage i doubt that will be a presentation but a couple of things to think about but i love the anatomical approach that you had uh had mentioned so a um, couple of things where where we can think about uh what may be causing this pain i also want to want to know the intensity if it is this something really really painful that could be inflammatory um versus other types of pain that could be mild or moderate so back to you, Ria. Awesome thoughts. Um, and, you, and you really nailed making this diagnosis tailored to a 10-year-old boy. <laughs> uh, they love to jump off of things. But in this case, there was no history of trauma. Um, he has not had any fevers. His pain um, was intermittent at first and has become more steady Um pretty much 10 out of 10. And if you see a 10 year old boy in 10 out of 10 pain, that's a, that's legitimate pain. He now has intractable vomiting, um, due to the pain. He has not had anything, um, that he doesn't typically eat. Uh, he has had normal urination, no dysuria, um, no hematuria. He has not had any constipation. He's not had any diarrhea. Um, and like I said, no trauma. Did you want me to go on to the past medical history and such? I guess we could break here for a second. Anything um, you think, Hans, that or, that we can expand on with this HBI? I find it a little bit more difficult now because if you had constipation, we could uh, argue maybe it's obstruction that uh, gradually built up, but this we have to exclude as well from the uh, history. So no trauma. Kidney stone would be something that we would see in an adult, but not in a child. So now I'm no fever. So in a UTI that probably might cause some trouble like this, radiating from the pelvis all to the way to the kidney and causing left-sided flank pain, I don't see either. So now I'm really... At that point, I have nothing to add to our differential. Yeah, yeah, I have, I'm absolutely right there with you that I, I'm probably weeding out more differentials than including or bringing in more differentials. But uh, doesn't no fever necessarily rule out infection or inflammation? Uh, probably not. No, not. Uh, but this pain, you see, this this pain is ramping up. Initially was intermittent, then has become steady, and it's severe. So now I'm a little concerned about that. Intractable vomiting, could this be, as in the chat people are talking talking about, uh, what kind of organs are, are we dealing with on the left side? Again, if we go from the bottom up, uh, any sort of um, genital issues, testicular torsion, um, there's been no trauma to, to cause like a testicular hematoma, or rupture, or anything like that. But I can see that causing nausea, but then... I would then move move my um, attention to the GI tract, uh, nausea, intractable vomiting. Could there be obstruction? But again, it's kind of rather odd if it was in the abdomen, lower down the abdomen to cause to cause vomiting. But severe constipation I've seen cause cause vomiting and severe pain. Uh, so um, colonic obstruction, rupture. Then I think we'd have an acute abdomen, and then the patient would uh, would would manifest with um, 
emergency findings like hemodynamic instability, peritonitis, and so on. Uh, there's no hematuria, so does that rule out renal issues? Probably not if there was a renal stone. I guess uh, in the chat they mentioned renal stones unlikely. We may have it in an older population, but um, uh, I guess me metabolic issues, maybe you can manifest with renal stones at a, a young age. I, I forgot all the inborn uh, <laughs> metabolic errors and things like that, but there are certain group of um, disorders that can cause renal stones at a young age. And uh, polynephritis comes into mind too. Uh, that can be very painful uh, and it can ramp up like this and cause intractable vomiting, but is a, a highly, highly inf inflammatory condition. You get uh, perinephric stranding on imaging. So you can imagine the, the inflammation just permeating out of the kidney and causing causing inflammation in the 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 retroperitoneal bed where the kidney lies. So I can imagine immense amount of pain, but you would have fever with that degree of inflammation. So it's a little confusing there. Uh, there's no diarrhea, so probably not infectious um, colitis or anything uh, along that tangent. <clears throat> but um, dysuria also maybe rules out um, a, a lower uni tract infection, but then again, I'm, I'm considering upper urinary tract infection, colonic issues, um, testicular issues. Uh, the examination here, I think, will help along with um, possible augmentation by the by the CBC, looking for a, a white count to either swing the needle to an, an infection inflammatory condition or away from that. Back to you, Ria. All right. Excellent thoughts. And, um, you know, props to people who spelled into susception correctly in the chat. <laughs> That's also an excellent thought as well. So his past medical history, he was born full term. He is a healthy boy. He's up to date on his immunizations. He's had no prior histories of really any um, serious illnesses. Uh, he's not had any urinary tract infections. Um, his, he's not on any medications. He's been taking some ibuprofen for the pain and that's pretty much it. That's why kids generally are much easier. They don't have a long list of medications. For his family history, he, his father has um, had kidney stones. His paternal grandmother reportedly needed surgical removal of 12 stones in the past. Um, social history, he just moved from Honduras. Um, with his mother, his, sorry, with his father, his uncle, and his aunt, he has other siblings that are still in Honduras. He um, doesn't really have any other pertinent social history um, and no allergies. <clears throat> I can move on to the physical exam if you'd like. That'd be great, thanks. Okay, so his temperature was 36.9 degrees Celsius, which is 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. His blood pressure was 118 over 75. His pulse was 103. Um, respiratory rate was 22. He was on ambient air, setting fine. Um, he is on his growth curves. That's an important thing in pediatrics. Uh, so has been growing normally, height, weight, and BMI were all sort of tracking along his growth curves. He was um, alert and, and he looked like he was uncomfortable, um, but he had just gotten some medicines for pain. His HEENT exam was pretty unremarkable. He's not had any um, conjunctival icterus. His mucous membranes are moist and dry. <clears throat> uh, oh, sorry, moist um, and pink. He's got full range of motion of his of neck, no lymphadenopathy anywhere. His lungs are clear. Um, he is slightly tachycardic. Um, he does not have any murmurs or gallops. His tendon, uh, his abdomen was not distended. Um, some tenderness over the left upper and lower quadrants. Um, he didn't have any rebound tenderness or guarding, and he had normal bowel sounds. For genitalia, um, he is non-circumcised Tanner uh, stage one. Um, and of note, um, since we had testicular uh, pathology in our uh, differential, his um, testicles 
were non-tender and normal in appearance, and that's it for his physical exam. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, Hans, what do you think? Any ideas? Yes, I, I like the ideas of a mechal diverticulum. I don't know whether this causes pain, intussusception, or volvulus. But I'm concerned about the family history of kidney stones. A, a 10 year old with kidney stone would be, as I already mentioned in the chat, very, very unusual, but probably not impossible. But then he would have some hematuria, which has been denied in the HPI. So that is not the case. The testicle we ruled out. So I'm. I don't know what else to add to our differential at this point, other than the possibility of maybe having a look at at a kidney stone. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, uh, Hans. I'm I'm right there with you as well. That uh, history of kidney stones really got me thinking that this could be something at play. But I still want to work uh, with a with a broad list of all the possible other causes and not to just single out this. Uh, this as a as a um, possible distractor, so you know, we can probably anchor on this too. But um, I'm just wondering what kind of what kind of stones from from adult medicine we always we do know that majority of stones possibly due to hypercalcemia or calcium oxalate stones. I think uh, we see majority of times, but there's uh, other causes as well. For step one, we always uh, remember that uh, stones can also be of the struvite variety, so namely due to infections like Klebsiella or sometimes pseudomonas, or could there be a uric acid disorder? I, I think less likely, but uh, hyperuricemia can can manifest with uh, uric acid stones. And then there are these uh, cysteine stones that can also happen as well, causing the staghorn calculi. So those are u- usually the type of stones that we might see, but are we dealing with maybe, maybe a hypercalcemia process here? What are usual causes? Maybe excess vitamin D intake, hyperparathyroidism, uh, psychoidosis and a, a couple of disorders uh, that we can name that can cause this. But still, I want to keep an eye on all the other possibilities, like we had mentioned. Uh, Intrasusception was a great thought, something that we do um, consider with pediatric patients. But we had a great student VMR where there was intrasusception causing causing uh, uh, GI bleeding. And uh, it was something I, I haven't encountered in the adult population, but something we have to prioritize for GI bleeding and abdominal pain and distension. Back to you, Ria. All right, let me give you a couple of tabs and then we can I just talk about which what focus exams we want to do. His white count was 14.4, 84, I'm sorry, 81% neutrophils and a, an absolute neutrophil count of 11.7. His hemoglobin was 11 with a hematocrit of 33.3. His platelet count was 248. His um, sodium was 140, potassium 4.3, chloride 102, bicarb 25. His BUN was 21. His creatinine was 0.98. His glucose was 100. Um, I'll just say his mag, phos, and calcium were all normal. For his urine, urinalysis, uh, his specific gravity was 1.02. His urine was clear and straw colored. There were some ketones, rare mucus, only one white blood cell and one red blood cell. Okay, Hans, you want to take a stab at that? It's the high white blood cell count which sticks out with um, neutrophilic of 80%. So I'm I'm drifting a little bit towards an infection, but we have a clear urine analysis, which kind of speaks against a kidney stone at this stage. So we should, it was a good idea not to anchor on this one. What came to my mind was some kind of an inherited disease, which seems to 
manifest itself in this patient, looking at the family history again. But I'm, I'm not sure what he could have, but he could have a, maybe an infection or an abscess around the kidney as a possibility. That would not necessarily show in his um, urine, but it would manifest itself as uh, pain, gradually increasing. The fever can be present or absent, but he has a high white blood cell count. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the 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 white count definitely stands out there, and that does uh, move the the compass towards uh, the the needle of the compass towards the infection, inflammation. But what is a play here? I have no idea. <laughs> Could the again going through the motions? Uh, is this is it infection, inflammation within the bowel, uh, the kidney again? But you're right. Looking at the UA, we don't see. A uh, large number of white cells. We don't see um, nitrates, leukocyte esterase, all the the common occurrences that may may make you think that there's an infection within within the genital urinary system. So we may have to scratch that and move our focus on to other areas. But um, looking through the chemistry, I think uh, it would have been easier if we, uh, Dr. Dancela mentioned uh, the pathology is on the right side, so we have a lot more organs to play with. So the gallbladder, <laughs> appendicitis, right? <laughs> Unless there's an atypical appendicitis or something like that, but uh, but we but there's less systems to work with on the left side, so we 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 have to work with what we have. Um, again, yeah, the 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 agenda urinary exam was was unremarkable. Left upper and left lower quadrant tenderness. And again, if there's a splenomegaly, that would cause pain, severe distension, infection. Yeah, if there could be infections associated with the spleen, splenic thrombi, splenic abscess, perisplenic abscess, or even um, any sort of disorder leading to the to the spleen. Uh, the colon as well. Diverticulitis would be unusual. It wouldn't account for the upper quadrant pain, but unless there was extension of the infection outside the the, the bowel wall, uh, like a peridiverticular abscess. Anything else? Retroperitoneal organs? Not quite sure. Um, and I'm ass I assume this patient hasn't had uh, a a uh, imaging done before, prior to this, right? No, um, he had not, um, as, or at least not that the, the family has told us and, you know, um, not that we could tell that he had from Honduras, but um, no, he'd been so well that I don't think he even had presented to anything outside of sort of nor normal well-child checkups. Someone did astutely point out the creatinine um, and, you know, since I threw a pediatric case at you, he... Um, was sort of a normal size for a 10 year old boy, uh, normal musculature. Um, and so a creatinine of 0.98 is higher than mine. I think the last time I had my creatinine checked, it was about 0.7 with, with my muscle mass and my weight. And so 0.98 is certainly something that someone astutely pointed out as maybe being a flag. Um, and yeah, I know, I wish I could tell you that it was right-sided. So you had a little bit more to work with It's definitely left-sided, definitely sort of more left lower and pelvic area. So um, be yeah, I have one, one idea to throw out there. If yeah. we're dealing with um, abnormal sexual development, if we have um, ambiguous well we have ambiguous genitalia i'm forgetting the whole term but you can have both female male organs are we dealing with if there's been no imaging before are we dealing with um the presence of ovary or other organs yeah. within this child too so do we have to start considering ovarian cysts torsion all these other things yeah. i don't remember a lot of it unfortunately but something you may have to could fill us in about yeah, and, and think that, you know he they we we did do a, a, a um, thorough exam and he does have two testicles and both were descended in the scrotum and both were non tender. Uh, but you guys are <laughs> really forcing you to think about a lot of genetic or sorry genetic and um, congenital things, which I think is great. So, if you would like to stop sharing, I can share my screen. 
Um, we really, it was, it was sort of the, 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 the pain I kind of agreed with you guys. The pain was really odd, left-sided sort of throughout his abdomen, but also in the lower pelvis. And so with the creatinine, we said, well, let's just look first and do sort of what we do for a normal urinary exam. Sorry, one second. Um, let me share. Share screen. Here we go. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. So this is low down um, above his pubic symphysis, and I'm doing a sagittal cut. Um, and this is where I could tell you as much or as little. I could let you sort of have a go at this. Um, I will say I am looking at his bladder. Um, I don't think that's giving away too much here because there's other things happening. So is this after voiding or has he, he been not, voiding? No, he had not voided yet. So this was sort of on a, with a full bladder. I guess we, we, we do image a lot of bladders and sometimes it's not unusual to see a bladder this side, but, but you want to make sure that it does uh, change to a smaller size after um, after um, clearing the bladder, after urinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he um, he had a fairly full bladder and felt like he needed to urinate, but and we let him urinate right after this, but um, we got this image first. And then there's a structure on the lower left side there at the beginning of the, the image, mm -hmm. sort of anechoic fluid-filled uh, structure. Is that? I'm going to go ahead and pause it and point out what you're talking about. So this right here? Yes. Yes. Um, and so this is a pretty normal appearing bladder. This sort of drew my eye as well. Um, and I think this was kind of tricky for me too, having looked at ultrasounds for at this point, <laughs> six years or so for a very, very long time. I, I'd never seen anything that looked like that before. I'm going to let it play. I'm going to let it play again. Um, and then see if anybody picks anything else up. And I think I saw um, Sanjay is here. And I think Gigi Lu just came in as well. Before I um, go on, I'm going to see if anybody, so Yaz says, are the ureters dilated or is it my imagination? So towards the end of the image, there is some um, material there. There's mm -hmm. some, it, it sort of changes from an anechoic to a density there, which is, Yep, hyperechoic. Right here. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's, it took me a while <laughs> to kind of pick that up too. Um, so there's something hyperechoic inside. And Sanjay has pointed out that there's some shadowing here. Right. I was going to say that if there's a stone, is there some acoustic shadowing? Right. All right. So let's hold that. Everything else looks fine. This bladder looks normal. It's a little bit big. Um, but like I said, he had to pee and we told him he couldn't yet until we took a look and then we let him go. Uh, but as we say in POCUS, one view is no view. So um, this is the transverse view. And then we turned our probe 90 degrees and got the sagittal view. So on the left side of the screen um, is his head. This is towards his head. The right side of the screen is towards his feet. And um, I'm going to pause it right there. Um, and see what y'all think of this. That is massive. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm just seeing a lot of wow in the chat. That's exactly uh, what I said. Too. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask our other uh, guests, Dr. Patel, Dr. Lou, if they want to unmute their mic and maybe help us out as well. Yeah. 
that's <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of folks say two bladders, and that's honestly what I what I pointed out to the residents too. Sanjay says um, his sound isn't working. I'm not sure if Gigi, Gigi can unmute herself. That's a good thought. So um, are, is this two bladders? Is there just one large septum here? Um, is it a large diverticulum? And as and, and so I think we are seeing something hyperechoic here. I hope you guys can see my, um, my cursor with with some shadowing um, and and just to show you what normal would look like a little bit of a anatomy going back to anatomy so this is again the transverse view so this is sort of the first view that we were talking about remember in our patient this is a normal but in our patient there was a very large hypoechoic area here with what we thought was a stone in it and what we're actually looking at here is the transverse view of the bladder and this is kind of fun to do, but drink a bunch of coffee and um, put color over the, the posterior um, wall of the bladder and you'll actually see ureteral jets. And so you'll see one of them firing and then another one is firing here. So both of them are firing on both sides. And that's just to help you get the anatomy of where the ureters come into the bladder. So they kind of travel down towards the pelvis and then they hook around and come in the posterior wall of the bladder. And so going back to this sagittal view, okay, does that help anyone kind of figure out maybe what's happening? Yeah, sorry, I meant to uh, pause that, not move forward. All right, pause. Yeah, I think we're now, now that we've sort of gotten normal anatomy in our head and, and POCUS is all about pattern recognition and understanding really well anatomy, we're all kind of landing on a dilated ureter with a stone. Um, big bladder here with an almost as large ureter. This is where it would insert and you've got this hypoechoic there, uh, echoic mass there. And so this is a mega ureter, true. So then, um, I never stop there. When, when I have something that looks this obstructed, I wanna take a look at the kidneys as well. And, and, and we'll notice, um, going back to this prior, we had a left-sided mega ureter. Right side didn't really see anything abnormal. When I do a POCUS exam, I do it the exact same way every single time. And that way I don't miss any part of the exam. So I go to the bladder, I do a transverse, and then I do a sagittal. And then I'll look at the right upper quadrant view to take a look at the kidney. And then I'll go over and, and look at the left. And so we've taken a look at the bladder. Um, these are just his measurements. This is the normal ureteral jets. And this is the right upper view. Does anybody want to? Um, Tell me what's happening here. Oh, great. Shema's nailed it. Yeah, lots of folks saying that we've got hydronephrosis. Um, do, do you want me to walk through this one, Ravi, or do you want to walk through it? Oh, yes, please, if you, if you don't mind, yeah, okay. that'll be helpful. So this is a coronal cut of the right upper quadrant. Um, again, everything to the left of the screen is towards the boy's head. Everything to the right side of the screen is towards his feet. Um, at the top of the screen is superficial and then the bottom of the screen is um, deep structures. And so superficially we see this large liver coming across and that's pretty typical appearance for a liver. A liver. And then deep to that we have kidney. <laughs> um, and folks have already started to say, this is hydronephrosis. Uh, do I have a normal kidney? I believe I do. Let's go look at a normal real quick. Okay, this is normal. This is my kidney. So superficial to deep. This is towards my head, towards my feet. This is my the little sliver of my liver. And then underneath that is my right kidney. Um, and you'll see that in the middle of a kidney, there should be a bright hyperechoic area where there's renal fat. Um, and that ha hang hangs out in the hilum of the kidney where all the collecting 
collecting ducts start to come out of the kidney. So this is actually um, the cortex of the kidney right here where all the urine is made, the collecting ducts come through and all collect here in the renal pelvis. And then normally you wouldn't see the ureter, but there may be a little bit of my ureter coming down and heading towards my feet. So the biggest architecture things I want to, I want you to freeze in your brain is um, in the middle of a kidney, there should be bright fat. So let's go back and take a look at that right kidney. Okay, so nothing but black in there. And we talked about black being urine. And so this is a lot of urine that's sort of backed up into the kidneys. We're not really seeing much of a cortex at all. It's actually effaced, which makes this severe hydronephrosis. We'll see some of the ureter coming down. And then just let me know in the chat, does this make sense to you? Having seen the bladder, um, and seeing the stone on the left side. Again, this is the right kidney. <laughs> I have a question where you, when we learn early POCUS, we use nomenclature bear claw and uh, yeah. pea, peas and pod. Does this look like that uh, bear claw designation that we give? This is even worse than a bear claw. So a bear claw, um, you will start to see sort of ballooning of these calyces, but generally they should leave the cortex alone. And so here oh, oh, on the upper pole of that kidney, you actually, you barely see any cortex at all. Once it starts to efface the, the cortex of the kidney and just really start to thin it out, that's severe. Bare paw, we sort of designate for more of the moderate hydronephrosis where you have ballooning of these calyces and you still have a decent amount of uh, cortex, uh, cortical rim. And in, in this case, this is this is really um, ballooning that cortex out. Okay. So Sanjay says right hydro, left impacted stone. Um, what's happening on the right side? And that's exactly what I was asking myself. Why, why do we have hydronephrosis on the right side? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I said, well, let's take a look at that left side because that's where I expected hydronephrosis to be. And this is the left side. So I will stop it at certain points here. Here we go. So this is again, towards the head, towards the feet, superior or um, yep, superior, superior and inferior or deep. Here's a, a little bit of the spleen, which I wasn't that interested in because it looks normal. And then I kind of slide down towards the feet and you can see nothing but black here. And it almost doesn't look like kidney at all. Um, and it was in fact really hard for us to really say that this was kidney. It's just so abnormal. Okay. Um, but these are the calyces that are so ballooned out. You don't even see any rim of cortex at all. And then you have the ureter actually starting to come out here, which as I said, you typically don't see ureter unless there's pretty bad pathology. Someone said polycystic kidney disease, and that's a really good thought. And I, I wish that I had put a case of polycystic kidney disease, um, in here, but what speaks against polycystic kidney disease is you can see they're all connected. Okay, so what's happening, the pathophysiology of this is urine is getting backed up. So here's the urine and it's coming back into the pelvis, okay, ballooning the pelvis. And it's so severe, it's actually coming out and ballooning all the calyces and thinning out the cortex. So all of this is connected, which, um, is different than polycystic kidney disease where you have all of the, the cysts that are not connected with each other. So two kidneys and uh, both look pretty bad, although the left looks worse than the right. So I'm gonna stop sharing there. You guys nailed that. I don't think there's anything else. Let me just make sure. Oh, yes. Would you like to see a CT scan? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that'll help. This is a CT scan. I was trying to pause it. So this is the right side of the, the body. This is the left side of the body. And you can see coming up here, both kidneys very much with hydronephrosis. And then here are the big ureters. 
I'm gonna let that go one more time because I think the kidneys are fairly easy to point out, but I want you to look at the ureters coming off of them. So there's one of them, there's the other, and then as they come down, really large ureter there, really large ureter there, and they're inserting into the bladder. So Dr. Doncello, just looking at that now, is kidneys, ureters, and bladder, bladder's full, is the obstruction we're thinking there is, there are stones, but then is there issue with bladder emptying? So we did allow him to um, empty his bladder, which he was able to do fully. And his bladder actually looked fairly normal. Uh, usually when there is bladder outlet obstruction, the, the, the bladder wall gets fairly thickened. And that's not the appearance that we saw with him, that he is able to void fully. Incredible. How often do would you see this in the pediatric population? I, I've, I've never seen never this. Never seen, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I couldn't even imagine. I see it in adult population, and this this is ex these images are extremely powerful. It's a, a once once you work with um, obtaining uh, images or image acquisition and learn renal ultrasound, it's very easy during the initial encounter in the emergency room if you have a patient with renal failure to to we usually use a schema pre intrauterine post. It's all it's very easy to do a uh, pointic ultrasound of the kidneys, bladder and to immediately exclude uh, the post-renal causes. And then you shift your, your attention to the intrarenal, pre-renal causes as well. So very, very, um, very powerful tool. And these images just help. And I think they're just uh, tr tremendous for, the, for our community, our audience to, to learn this, uh, at least the image interpretation. But yeah, um, yeah go ahead, sorry. Uh, so yeah, we started off with essentially our um, our schema for acute kidney injury um, and kind of overlaid that onto abdominal pain. And so the ski, you talked about the schema for acute kidney injury, which is pre, intra, and post. Far and away in children, we're talking about pre and intrarenal causes for acute kidney injury. And then you astutely, both of you started to think about his pain anatomically which was the right thing to do. And then if you sort of overlay those two things on, we said it's very easy to sort of rule out obstructive causes for acute kidney injury in this child. Let's go take a look. And that basically sunk our diagnosis right there. Incredible. And uh, how did uh, the patient do? He did really well after, after a fashion. Um, this case, I've never seen anything like this before. And honestly, I don't know that I've ever seen even, you know, typically we will see a unilateral obstruction um, caused by, there's a couple of things that can cause this. One you alluded to, Ravi, which is posterior urethral valves. And that's when you un are unable to void. Um, and you know, the, instead of being able to void and urine come out of the urethra, there's sort of backflow and they go into the kidneys. And um, so that can be bilateral, that can be unilateral, just depending on which kidney has more reflux to it. Alternatively, you can have um, congenitally uh, stenosis or something that goes wrong in the, when the ureter connects into the bladder. And that is typically unilateral. So to see something bilateral like this is, is quite unusual. And so the stone was actually um, an effect of having bilateral stenosis of the ureters and urinary stasis. So the stone was what came, what made him come to our attention, but the pathology had been ongoing since he was born. Um, and, and probably development in utero. So what happened is they put in a stent. Um, on the left side, there was no stone on the right side. They put a stent in on the left side to um, sort of drain that, that kidney. And then eventually he had to have both of his ureters re-implanted. And in path on pathology, it looked like in, during in the insertion of where the ureters went into the bladder, there was actually bilateral stenosis. And I actually had a conversation with the, the urologist yesterday to say, what 
caused that. I've never seen this before. They've never seen it before. Um, and the hypothesis is that this is something that had um, had something to do with the way that his ureters implanted into his bladder. Oh, incredible. I, I wouldn't have thought about uh, the stone being after the fact. The stone, um, yes. The stone was yeah. a result. It was not a cause, although it brought him to our attention. And I think his his creatinine is now back down to 0.5, which is more of what we would expect in um, a child of his age. Awesome. Uh, it's great to hear that uh, this finding truly, you were able to help uh, help this young patient. Uh, Hounds, any reflections? An incredible case. Just uh, I've never seen anything like this before. Yes, I just mentioned in the chat. I mean, I've learned about posterior urethral valves and um, the reflux, but I, I've never really seen it. This was just, it was kind of overwhelming and see it on both sides and a stone forming on the left side because of uh, stasis. It's, it's really, I think it's almost breathtaking. A great job, Barnes. That was a great discussion. Thanks for thanks for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, I'm just amazed if if uh, the patient didn't come in at this time, he would have developed uh, overwhelming sepsis. I guess the the urine would have become infected at at some at point. Some, at some point, yes, I think, and that was kind of amazing to everyone, including the urologist, that he had not had a pyelonephritis in the past. Um, but yes, he either would have had a pyelonephritis. I think had this kept on going, um, we maybe would not have gotten function back from those kid from those kidneys just from the amount of pressure. All right, oh, awesome! Uh, kudos to your team, and uh, also kudos to you, Doctor Danso, for presenting this uh, fantastic case. Thank you for bringing it today. We'll uh, go ahead with teaching points. I think Deborah's sharing a teaching points. Yeah, thank you so much for the case. It was really great. So uh, going for the teaching points, we thought about the abdominal pain last side, we thought about the trauma or to be the testicles or affection or renal colic constipation. And then we think about the time because four days could be a long time. And we thought about the visceral vascular or obstruction cause. And as the patient presented um, nausea and vomiting, we thought about the GI causes like chronic obstruction, acute abdomen, spironephritis, vulvos, appendicitis, and macrodiverticulin. And we, as the patient had to a, fam, a family history from kidney disease, we thought could be that could be related. And we go through a calcium, phalato, a true stone due to a faction assisting stones that could be caused by a, a PCT transfer defect, and then a larger payer patch that could be caused by a recent inflammation or infection. And in this patient, we had the creatinine that was high, and then we think about that this is a huge flag. And what we have to take from this case is that the normal kid, we have to see in the, in the middle, we have to see bright, as Dr. Ria said, and we make the differential about the hydronephrosis that looks all connected and the polycystic kidney disease that the cystic looks like separate and not connected. So thank you so much. Thanks, Deborah. That was, that was great. Uh, I think there's a question. We're, Dr. Dancer, we stretch it out to the hour mark. So, uh, <laughs> But we have a few minutes. Uh, Yasmin, you have a question there? Do you want to share with uh, Dr. Dancer in the audience? Yes, that's oh, it, the only thing I was asking about uh, in uh, exposure to any kind of meds in utero for this kind of patients is because in the board exams, uh, mind you, I'm preparing for my steps, so that's why I was asking. They keep making this correlation that yes, that an anomaly of the kidney and ureters are, are environmental factors, specific genes, but they also have linked it to ACE inhibitors used during pregnancy. That's why I was asking if maybe. Uh, the mom had any history so yeah that was the only question that, that's an excellent thought and we didn't specifically ask about mother's medications uh, we did ask about family history and we're told that mom was healthy 
Uh, so I, I, you know, we could have done a better job at specifically saying was mom on ACE inhibitor or anything for hypertension. That's an excellent thought. Yeah, great, great question, Yasmin, especially the link. We have a lot of people taking steps, so important to know. I also want to just recognize Dr. Dr. Patel and Dr. Liu have been uh, contributing to this uh, this month of POCUS VMR. So I uh, want to appreciate all of you for bringing this to, to our audience. And uh, I guess this now concludes August uh, POCUS VMR, but hopefully the door is open to Dr. Dancel, Dr. Liu, Dr. Patel to, to come back. We'll have some dates to do some more POCUS VMR. So if you have any cases uh, in, in your drive that are available, um, polish them off and we'll, we'll definitely communicate with you to bring them back. So, all right, everybody, have a great uh, rest of the Tuesday afternoon. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.